Hi. Hey, hey. Hello. Oh, I see some faces already. Hi, hey. Ashley. Hi, Abigail. Hi, Brittany. Hey. Hi, Talia. I see more faces. I can't, I can't shout you all out, but <laughs> join us. Come on in. Oh, you guys are so cool. Oh my God. Look at all the interns. So silly. Yes. Okay. We can get started. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's so great seeing all of your faces here today. Um, I want to welcome you all to our Lunch and Learn Academy here at the Ad Club. For those who don't know me, I'm Aisha Brown, the Foundation and Inclusion Director here at the Ad Club. Um, we're actually so thrilled to have you all join us this summer as you all prepare for your future careers. Each of you were handpicked um, as we believe that you all embody the drive to be successful in this industry. Um, and as always, we're here to help you along the way. I know this journey can be scary, but that's why we're here to help you hone your soft and professional skills so you all can be the bright shining stars that you are. Um, today, we're just going to take you through who we are, what the Ad Club does. But first, there's some housekeeping rules that um, we want to go over. So Maya, take it away. I sure will. Hi, everybody, Gross Fellows, Clear Channel interns, Ad Club interns. It's good to see you all here um, on time. I love it. I'm just going to run through the um, housekeeping. But before I do that, I just want to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Maya J. Rushing. I'm the project manager of the foundation. You can call me Maya. You can call me MJ. Or you can call me Miss Rushing. Some of the housekeeping that I want to run through is deadlines and timeliness. I've mentioned this in my email, but I just want to make sure that it's really ingrained into you, that it's important for you guys to respond to our emails in a timely fashion, to meet um, action items in a timely fashion, and to email us if you cannot or if you cannot make it. Please let us know in advance if you cannot make a Lunch and Learn. It's totally fine. We have our recorded sessions for, you know, dire projects or you know circumstances at work that you need to be present for but just let us know ahead of time thank you to the ad club interns who have completed their nbi assessment just a reminder for those who have not completed it that you have till 3 p.m today to submit it um lastly use your contact sheet i've shared you all a contact sheet which has the emails of all of the interns that you see here today. And it also allows you to network by adding in context as we meet new, new people. Be sure to use that. Be sure to connect with each other because this is a platform for you and a resource for you to thrive and grow as Aisha so beautifully said. So with that in mind, we're going to take you through the club and we're gonna start by introducing you to our membership and programs team. Alicia. Hi, hey everyone. I'm Alicia Greenberg. Oh, wait, wait, Gina wants to go. Gina, go, go first. first. Gina, you're absolutely welcome to go first. <laughs> You'll all, you can all appreciate this. I have a high school senior that has a prom today. And so the house is a little helter skelter. So we're trying to, um, I'm trying to get this. I want to say hi to all of you and really um, impress upon you the importance of this internship. An internship changed the trajectory of my career. And I think that you don't realize that when you're in it. Um, but if you, do re if you do realize that or somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, listen, pay attention because this could mean something. I was a finance major in college. I had all intentions of being you know, a broker on Wall Street and I had a summer internship at a um, public relations firm that changed everything for me. So imagine what your experience this summer can do. You're on a track, you're gonna meet people from all different companies representing all different facets of the industry, different um, levels of experience. And somebody might speak to you directly the way my internship spoke to me. So I, um, I tell you to buckle up, enjoy the ride. Um, you're gonna learn a lot. You're gonna um, meet a lot of great people. 
these assessments that you're doing, it's the biggest gift I think that we can actually hand over to you because you're going to really learn what makes you tick and what you bring to the party. And it'll also share with you maybe areas where a little bit of development could help. So take all of this in. As um, Aisha and Maya said, even though we're virtual, we've all learned how to be virtual and still feel a connection. So make the most of this. The Ad Club team is here to support you throughout the process. Every one of us is reachable, answers emails, happy to do one-on-ones. So um, please use this experience as a first step in preparing yourself for your first um, for your first job. I wish you a great, great summer. And like I said, here to here to catch you, hold your hand, um, laugh with you, whatever it is, we're here. So I wish you all the best. I'm not going anywhere. I just wanted not to get lost <laughs> in the uh, in the list of everyone that's going to talk to you today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gina. For those, um, that's Gina. She is the CEO and president, and she's our amazing boss here at the Ad Club. So thank you for that, Gina. <laughs> so I'll chime in. Hello, I'm Alicia Greenberg. Can you hear me, everybody? Am I on? Okay. Yes. I'm the VP of membership and programs at the club. And um, let me, can I get a, a quick show of hands? How many of you are in clubs at school or fraternities or sororities? Can I see like a quick show of hands? Not surprising most of you because I've, you made it here because most of you are probably super great at networking. And the reason I asked that question is because some people don't understand what a trade association is or what the ad club is. Um, but think of it in terms of when you graduate school, we're your fraternity sorority of, or club for your career. So if you're in advertising, marketing, and media, um, I, I'll give you an example. I'm a, I'm a Syracuse SU graduate, um, go orange. And um, by being a member of the club after college, um, you then get to have your new network, your new association, um, your new club, if you will. So um, a big part of that is think of it also, I use a lot of analogies in terms of a gym or health club membership, right? When you become members, think of the club as your place for continuing your business health and wellness, right? So it's a place for you to get information, to learn and to network. Um, so, but a, a health club memberships only is good as um, you use it, right? So I encourage you all to think about the club in that form, use it, um, use it to connect with colleagues, use it to um, get advice, use it to get content. So our membership here and the role that I have here is making sure we're bringing in new members and making that value for people who are members. We have students and then we have young pros who are under 30. So we're here as you go through your career continuum, right? All the way up to people on our board used to be young pros. So um, it's a great, it's a great um, place for your career cycle, your career continuum. And then on the programming side of things, I kind of look at us, or you can think of us in terms of the Netflix for business content, right? So if you need content for your business, um, think of us as a channel that you can turn to for getting that information. But the super cool thing is, as you get involved in the club, you can also be a producer of content, right? We, we create content for members by our members. So as you, after your program, if you become a member down the road as a young pro, you have a content idea, we're a platform for you. You can interview people. You can come up with social media ideas. So we're a membership, but we're also that content platform to help with your fame factor. So I feel like it's just important as you go into this program to understand where the club is you know, in your marketing ecosystem. So think of us in those terms. 
Um, but I think the best way to for you to understand that is to hear from somebody who's kind of been doing this for a while, um, or I should say has been on a similar path. So I'm going to toss it over in a second to my colleague Meredith Lipson, who works with me in programs and, you know, has come from college into the club and into her career. She's going to give you a few pieces of, of advice. But you can also reach out to me, um, Alicia, at theadvertisingclub.org. I'm always here to help answer questions, um, give career advice, and it's a pleasure to see all of you. And I'm so excited. Take advantage of this opportunity. Kind, you're on the inside track here, right? You're ahead of the game because you're here with us now. So we're really excited for you. Um, so Meredith, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith. Uh, Lipson. I work with Alicia on programs and membership. So great to see you all and I'm sure you're all very excited for your summer to begin. Um, like Alicia said, I've been at the club for almost two years and um, like all of you, I did an internship every year in college and I feel like um, the best part about internship is just that hands-on learning that you get that you don't get anywhere else. So like if you know, you are, are maybe a communications major like I was or, you know, an advertising major or something that your school may offer. I always felt, at least for me, I always felt like it was all very theoretical. Um, and you're learning a lot and you're reading a lot of articles, but you're not really getting that practical learning experience. So I think internships, especially this one, is going to give you the tools um, to really take your career to the next level so that when you do go into the real world, and this is what I found for myself, so speaking from personal experience, I felt much more well equipped. And of course, once you start a job, you learn even more. But that's something that I think you'll find this summer to be extremely beneficial. And I remember when I first started at the club, it was in July. So I was able to go to those lunch and learns. Of course, they were in person when I was there. But um, those are so amazing. And I would suggest really taking opportunities to network within the, those like that is a once in a lifetime opportunity to be in the office or in the office with, you know, some really cool people. So definitely make sure that you're networking and you're using your um, kind of network as much as possible. Um, and I would say, and Alicia, why don't we talk just briefly about working at the ad club. So the ad club is a trade association, like Alicia said, and something I would say that you get at a company like this that you might not get elsewhere is because we're a small team of eight and you'll meet everyone shortly. Um, we're super scrappy and agile and you learn to sort of pivot really quickly and, and problem solve in a way that I never had before. So I think that there's such a benefit to working at a small company where you have to be scrappy and kind of problem solve quickly and come up with ideas that you might and, and learn new skills. Like for example, somehow I'm, I've am i learned to like code a little bit through this job. So it's just another thing to add to my resume. So I would say that um, I'm really excited for all of you. I think you're gonna have a great summer. And like Alicia said, I'm here. If you have any questions, um, I will be here through July 1st um, actually headed to law school in the fall, but the club is an amazing place and I'm excited for you all to experience it. Thank you guys so much. Again, that was our membership and programs team, Meredith and Alicia. Next, we're going to hear from our Andy's team. Ariel, are you on? Yes, I uh, found you. I'm here. My name is Ariel Blakeman. I'm the director of um, the creative arm of the club. Um, primarily the International Andy Awards, um, and my partner in crime, Ines um, Hassan here. And we are fortunate to have our um, intern this summer, Nicole, who's here. She started yesterday. Um, so just briefly wanted to touch on what the Andes are, and then uh, we would really love to show you a couple pieces of, uh, of winning work uh, from this past season. So, um, so as Alicia mentioned about how membership is really a guiding light throughout your career from where you are now, you know, in college um, through to the C-suite, the Andes are very similar in that um, we have a student competition, which we'll, Ines will, will speak to uh, in a bit, but then all the way through your mid-level career where you, you know, you're 
you are the top of your game and you start winning Andy awards among other industry awards. And then, you know, you reach, um, you know, maybe you're the, the chief creative officer level and then you're invited on to be part of this global jury. So a couple of top line things about us, um, as the Ad Club is a not-for-profit um, and we give back through mentorship programs, obviously the internship program, scholarships, et cetera, um, we, you know, like to feel like we have a higher purpose than other shows that are category driven um, and kind of just a, a money maker. So that's one thing that really, you know, feels true to the club and everything that we do. Um, speaking out, so top talent, those who get to the CCO, Chief Creative Officer level, um, we are well known and have been known for many years of having the top creative leaders represented on our jury. It's one integrated jury, um, it's holistic, it's an idea-based show. Like I said, um, you know, other shows are all about categories and, um, and silos and we're really holistic. It's all about the idea, it's about the craft, it's about innovation, and it's about bravery. So the Andes on our 50th anniversary, uh, what we did was look back at the, the last half century, half century of advertising and what was the common element that the best work throughout the decades had, and that was a sense of bravery. Whether that be uh, provocative work, um, you know, the client would have gotten fired, had this had a bad a negative reaction in the world. Um, a lot, there's a lot of different layers and components of what bravery in advertising is. Um, and that's just, that's one of the strongest components that, uh, that we have. Uh, we do programming all around that. Um, and it's some of the richest, you know, work and richest conversations. So hopefully we can uh, share more of that with you this summer. Um, another thing is the transparency. We are the only show uh, that I know of, a, even across industries, that invites the community, the industry worldwide into the judging room. So not only are you learning about the winners, but folks across the board can literally listen and hear why their work didn't do well or why this piece of work rose to the top or, oh, you know, it just didn't quite, you know, hit the mark. So think of it like if you're watching the Golden Globes or the Oscars and something wins and it's arguably disputed, but you really don't have any idea why the Academy, you know, the, the people who selected it went that way. So we wanted to lift the curtain up and um, allow people into the room. Um, so we're really proud of, of that component. And then lastly, we're the first of the year. Um, we are, we, the entry period is December, October really, through March and then judging, and then we're the first to announce. So um, you'll learn through your career in advertising that the award season um, kind of goes through the first half of the year, culminating with uh, Can Lions. And so what wins at the Andes early on usually goes on to win at subsequent shows. So with that said, I would really love to show um, two pieces, the two highest ranking pieces of work in this past season. Um, they're very, both, both very different. Um, the first one we're gonna see, well, I don't know which one we're gonna see first, but one is a beautiful crafted film. Some of you may have, have seen it. And the other is just a really innovative, um, execution that we haven't seen before. So let's go ahead and take a look. You love me. You love me not. You love black culture, but do you love me? You love how I sound, my voice, these beats, this flow. Not me though, right? You love how I look, my hair, this skin, but me, nah. We don't get to exist. We're forced to survive. We still fight. We still play while the world burns. On fields that ain't even level. All men are created equal. <laughs> That's my favorite part. 
You hate us so deeply, but you're still so impressed. Why can't you see? There's history in our skin. You built this country on our backs. I'm him. He's me. She. Us. We. Are all black. Black. Love me or not, we love each other deeply. We gon' be us. We gon' break bread. We gon' defy gravity. You love my culture, but do you love me? <laughs> What a world that would be. In February 2021, Reddit was the talk of the Super Bowl. But the week before that, we were the talk of the financial world. This story is stunning. We are watching this day trading frenzy fueled by investors using their phones and communicating on Reddit, a Reddit message board called Wall Street Bets. Reddit, 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 Reddit. Reddit. With a once in a lifetime event happening before our eyes, we had to seize the moment. And since our community challenged the status quo, we did too in the one place nobody expected. It is finally here, Super Bowl 55. But how could we stand out with no budget, no celebrities, and only a week to go before the game? Damn it! By crashing the party. What the f is this, y'all? Our five second spot rolled out in waves across the country. <laughs> this is going crazy! Starting a groundswell of conversation with viewers forced to either pause. What is this? Or go online to make sure what they just saw was real. Reddit actually did it. I really thought that Reddit users hacked CBS. My mom still thinks Time Warner broke. As far as Super Bowl, I really like when Reddit did. Many on Twitter even regarding this as the best Super Bowl ad of all time. The commercials read at the end, powerful things happen when people rally around something they really care about. It was a good idea to take advantage of the interest around Reddit to get more people using all kinds of Reddit. All in all, the ad was covered by over 300 news outlets, earning 6.5 billion impressions. And we not only crashed the Super Bowl, Reddit crashed too. Site traffic spiking as much as 25%. Even the subreddit in our ad, which is actually Superb Owl, soared 1,000%. And we were the most searched ad of Super Bowl Sunday. But best of all, with a little inspiration from our communities, we bet that even as an underdog, we could show up big. And like the ad said, if you're reading this, our bet paid off. So those are just um, two of the highest ranking pieces. You can see all of them um, on our website, andyawards.com, um, for any inspiration or to learn more. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ines. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ines, I'm the project manager here at the Andes. I've been working with Ariel for almost three years now, which is really amazing. Um, uh, I wanted to tell you guys about the student competition that we have, which is, um, it's basically the same as a professional competition, but you know, students can submit. And um, not only do we reward students for like their, their great work, but we also, provide them exposure to the same jury as the professional work. And um, that exposure allows them to get jobs, um, connect with jurors at the, and these, like Ariel said, the jurors at the highest level. And we also believe, and we know for a fact that um, our students and you guys, and just the students currently in school are literally the future of our industry. So it's so important for us to invest in them. So we, Every year we give a $10,000 scholarship to the best um, student work, the best in show, and that helps students propel in their career. But we also provide access um, for those students to our jury and our community to like start and become a part of our community. So that way they can slowly emerge themselves. And um, uh, I'm gonna show you guys, well, Amaya is gonna show you guys a, the video of this year's student winner that won a $10,000 scholarship, which is the Glenn C. Smith Award. 
and um, it's called the, Spo the Spoiler Billboard, and um, Maya will cue the video now. And this was from a, a student in Germany. So the award show is global. So this was a German student that won the award. And I'll kick it back to Maya and Aisha. Thank you so much, Andy's team. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Media Action, which powers the foundation. So uh, go ahead, Chris, I'm gonna spotlight you. You're on mute. Aisha, can you unmute her? I'm sorry, I was multitasking. Um, I was actually sending a photograph of our, our established um, interns here. So sorry, you caught me off guard. I am Chris Early and I work on Media Action, which is our the club's largest fundraiser. And um, simply, I'm going to try to share my screen and can see, tell me if I did okay. I'm just gonna go, here we go. The reason why I wanted to pull up this screen is because we have three slides here, but the, the, found, the media action is our largest fundraiser and it helps to fuel everything we do with the Ag Club's foundation. And I'm very proud of where we have come. I've been at the Ag Club for a long time. I won't tell you the digits, but um, at any rate, I will share, we can share this, Maya can share this with you later too, because the links, to go, the, the fact that I love this slide is because it shows all the programs and it links to more information about what these programs do, who is affected by it, and who's growing because of this. So I just wanted to share that particular slide. Um, I don't want to get into all the nitty gritty, so I'll just broad stroke the fact that Publishers donate space to the club. We go out and sell the space. We reach out to our brand partners and brand is a fancy name for clients. <laughs> and um, we ask them to earmark a percent, small percentage of their annual um, media spend and purchase their media from our people that have donated to us. And it's, um, it's push and pull, uh, and yet the story that we have been building and growing um, helps us to carry it further so that brands are not only backing this, um, they're running their own ads, but they are showing that they are in support of all of our DEI um, efforts. And uh, so as the story blossoms, and I'm just going to segue for a minute by telling you one of the things I'm most proud of, is that six years ago, we came up with a fellowship program. And I know the gals from from the foundation, we'll get into it, but the fellowship program brings mid-level women into the industry and we introduce them through different conferences throughout the year, uh, even virtually. And it's just great to see them soar and grow. Uh, every time I pick up the phone to ask for money, um, that helps me to make that an easier ask because the story is so impelling and real. And that's just one of the highlights. So um, again, I won't get into all of this, but I wanted to show you this slide because it shows you all of our partners and it's really kind of colorful and fun. I mean, we have brands like American Express, Unilever have been there for years. They're our top brands. They earmark a large amount of money each year. Um, we have had new people come in like MasterCard and um, we, have, we definitely have, the, our publishers are from Meredith to um, BuzzFeed to 
um, you know, all sorts of people like Verizon themselves as an organization gets involved with not only buying the media, um, but they also donate media and their agency is VM1 and they help to facilitate. So basically publishers donate, marketers purchase and agency, agencies help facilitate. And then the funds go to help all of the things that we do with regards to our foundation. Thank you for letting me share. Now, meanwhile, I have one more thing I'd like to do if we can put it on gallery view. Do you mind, Maya? Um, when, in the days when we were real, <laughs> in reality days, um, we basically had, uh, I got to photograph everybody. I don't know why it's, oh, here it is, gallery. I got to photograph everybody. So now that we're virtual for still another while longer, I want everybody to say cheese, one, two, three, cheese. Okay, one more, on two, one, two. There you go. That keeps me going. So thank you for letting me share that with you. <laughs> thanks so much, Chris. And thanks sure. to the Ad Club team for joining in and sharing, you know, your different respective roles in the, the part in the club. We have a few more minutes before we jump into our tactical workshop with our very special guests. So Aisha and I would love to play an icebreaker game with you all so we can get to know you guys better. And uh, we decided to go with two truths and a lie. So um, Aisha, you can go first. <laughs> okay, well, I will go first. Here is my two truths and a lie. Um, one, my grandparents had 12 children. Two, I was scouted to play Nyla in The Lion King on Broadway. And three, I have never been to California. So which one is my lie? Throw it in the chat. We'll see who's gotten close. I think. Ooh, Jaquie says you've never been to Cali. Anyone else? Oh, everybody's saying California is a lot. Okay. <laughs> but yes, you guys are absolutely right. I, of course, I've been to California. My grandparents did have 12 children, no twins at all. And when um, I was born and raised in New York City, I used to go to Harlem School of the Arts and I did take acting. And I was actually scouted to play Nala in The Lion King. However, I was too tall. So I, oh. I didn't have the opportunity. Yeah, I was so mad and so bummed, but but good job. All right. That's so, amazing. I yeah. never knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, we've got celebrities on the club, in the club. <laughs> I so, wouldn't um, do that. <laughs> I'll go next with my two troops and a lie, and you guys can just go ahead and throw it in the chat again. And then I'm going to popcorn it to one of you. So I'm just going to randomly spot a name and call you out. And I would love it if you could share. Camera on or off. It's up to you. So my two truths and a lie, I'm actually Canadian born, um, Canada born, I don't really know if that was good English, but I'm born in, born in Canada, I'm left-handed and I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. Nyla said that the lie is that I'm Canadian. Some people are saying I'm not left-handed. Some people are saying Harry Potter, all right. I love the variety here. The truth is I'm not from Canada. I'm 100% American, <laughs> but that was a great way to start the game. So I'm gonna popcorn to Jensine Mattis. Did I say your name right? Awesome. Yeah, Jensine. Hi everyone. Um, my two truths and a lie would be, uh, my favorite sport is basketball. I'm a poet and I have a dog named Rufus. Okay, we've got a lot of people saying that uh, Rufus is a lie, but we've also got some saying basketball. Why don't you uh, tell us what the, the lie is? The lie is that I don't have a dog named Rufus. Oh, wow. <laughs> on that one. <laughs> the C is crazy here. Jensine, I'm gonna let you popcorn it off to someone and we'll continue on that way until we begin our tactical workshop. Okay, I'll call on Nicholas Suit. Did I say his name right? 
Yep. Um, so my two truths and a lie would be I have an identical twin brother. Um, I'm a Game of Thrones fan and I was born in California. So let's see what happens in the chat. Oh, you're not a twin is what everybody's saying. I think you weren't born in California. Oh, someone said Game of Thrones, two people. Maybe twin, oh, sister. Oh I like that, Talia. All right, tell us the truth, Nicholas. Yes, yeah, so I was not born in California, but I do actually have an identical twin brother. Oh, wow. Whoa. I didn't That's know cool. that. Who's older? My brother is. Okay, nice. Popcorn it, Nicholas. Um, hi, Popcorn, Ashley B. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Baptiste. Um, my two truths and a lie would be I played the violin in high school. Um, I was born in Trinidad. And I took a summer trip to Spain. Everybody's saying Spain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so like Derek said, Derek said that you, the violin's the lie. Give us uh, the um, truth. So I did not take a trip to Spain. So everyone was right. <laughs> but I was born in Trinidad and I played the violin in high school. Nice. Okay, pass it on. Keep it going, keep it going. Uh, I popcorn uh, Lan Bricola. Hi. Hi guys, I'm Lon. Um, my two truths and a lie. I was born in Italy. I had three eye surgeries and I have a turtle named Sebastian. You have a turtle named Sebastian? That's the lie. Everybody else is guessing Italy. Okay, one person said you have Sebastian, three surgeries, turtle, turtle. Okay, tell us the truth. What's the lie? The lie is that I was born in Italy. I was actually born in China. Uh, so I'm just guessing wrong for everybody, okay. That's cool. <laughs> Lon, go ahead and popcorn it off to someone else. Uh, Inika Sani, if I pronounce that right. It's Inika, but yeah. Inika. Um, <laughs> um, so mine are, I have never been to Target. My favorite food is cheese. And I've lived in four countries. I want to say the Target one too, guys, but that sounds so obvious. I feel like it's the cheese one too. It's the cheese yeah. one? I got one. <laughs> really? You know, how have you never been to Target? <laughs> what? Never. <laughs> so I think we should take a summer trip, guys, all of us. We should just oh. go to Target. And you know, yes. buy you everything. Know. <laughs> yeah, bring your own cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Popcorn it off and you go to somebody else. Um, Alexa. Okay, hi everyone. Um, mine are that I used to play soccer. I have a puppy and I was born in New York. Okay. So Sorry, it was glitching. <laughs> um, puppy. Um, my lie is soccer. Soccer oh. is actually my least favorite sport. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll popcorn. Um, Talia. Hi. Um. Okay. Mine are. I played three musical instruments. I moved twice in my life and I have one dog. This is the dog. I think it's the dog too. Everybody's saying the dog. I just said moved once. One said moved twice. Okay, what's the lie? I've actually never moved anywhere. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Okay, popcorn it. 
Okay, all popcorn to Sonia. Um, okay, so I've never seen a Broadway show. I'm a Giants fan and I have a fish named Nemo. You guys have great names for your pets. <laughs> Giants fan, Broadway, Giants, 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 Giants. Okay, what's the truth? Um, so, or the lie? Yeah, I'm, what's the truth about the lie? Uh, so, so I actually have seen a Broadway show. Okay. <laughs> nice. Wow. I think we have time for a couple more before we take it over to our tactical workshop. So go ahead and popcorn it, Sonia. Um, Simran? Thank you. So um, mine would be, I know three languages. Um, I have five dogs and I wasn't born in the United States. The dogs, everybody's saying the dogs. Everybody's saying it. <laughs> Alicia said born in the US. What's the lie? It's the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, I figured. And you can pass it off to someone else. Hi. Abigail? Hi, everyone. You can call me Abby. So <laughs> my three, no, my two truths and a lie. I'm 5'8", I have a cat, and I'm a Pisces. Abby, I think Abby's a Pisces. I don't think you're 5'8". Everybody's saying between Pisces and 5'8". <laughs> What's the lie? I'm not 5'8". I'm 5'5". Five five. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell through Zoom. <laughs> All you see is like shoulders and up. So you, know, you could have easily gotten away with that. And then Abby, go ahead and pass it to one more person. And then we're going to get started with our tactical workshop. OK, I popcorn to Nicholas. Not soup, I'm assuming. <laughs> Uh, my three things are, I've been to Stonehenge, uh, I have one dog, and I can play the uh, cello. I'm going to go with the dog. I'm seeing a lot of dogs and cellos. A couple people think that the Stonehenge is the lie. Mainly seeing cello. All right, Nicholas, what's the... The lie is the uh, cello. Really? Oh, man. Okay, so I did pretty bad here, but <laughs> it was really great getting to know some of you uh, through those truths and lies. You guys have very interesting uh, backgrounds and lives, and I would love to continue to get to know each other as we go through our summer programming. Um, moving into our tactical workshop, I'd love to introduce you to one of our Ad Club fellows, um, Kristen Paris, who's People's Growth Partner for DoorDash, and she's going to take you through her tactical workshop on decision making. So Kristen, I know you're on. I'm just searching for you briefly. I'm in here. There you are. Here in the party. All right. Hello, hello, party people. Let me go ahead and share my screen because I do have some slides I'm going to walk through um, to facilitate this discussion. Um, so is this gonna share? Yeah, here we go, here we go. All right, so um, as Maya said, my name is Kristen Paris. I also go by KP, so I will respond to that if you call me that. Um, I am a people growth partner at DoorDash, which means that my team really leads the learning and development enterprise-wide. And I am a, a fellow um, from the Ad Club I'm Part Fellowship. So I am really excited to host this conversation with y'all today. Um, honestly, in the last year or so, I've had a really amazing experience as being part of the fellowship. And so I kind of just jumped at this opportunity to be able to create a, uh, a space to give back, right? So I'm, I'm happy to have this conversation. We're talking about decision-making. As I was preparing for this, I was really brought back to the first kind of big girl decision that I made. And for me, that was that first job after college. And so recognizing that y'all are in a kind of similar place and that might be top of mind for you, I, I thought that that might be a really good place for, for us to start. And, and as I think about that first job for me, I honestly was not particularly strong in my decision making at that point. And so recognizing that first decision was like, 
filled with anxiety. I, I don't think that I was able to move with, with any degree of intention. And I ended up in a job that I absolutely hated. And so when I think about that particular experience, like the, the, the decision-making process itself felt really fear-based. So I was really scared of being jobless and, and kind of disappointing my parents, myself. I relied really heavily on other people's opinions. I didn't have a strong enough kind of sense of my own intuition and kind of what I wanted and what I desired. And so I, I relied almost exclusively on what other people thought was, was a better plan for me. And then the last thing that I think kind of shot me in the foot was this belief that I had limited choices. So I didn't feel like I, I had as many options. And so because of that, I just kind of went with what was available. So I, I don't want any of you to walk into your decision with that level of fear and anxiety and lack of intention. And so I hope that this conversation today creates a little bit of space to think about how you can move into your next big decision with way more confidence than I had in that particular one. So I um, want to start from this place of just kind of identifying why does this matter? Why are we talking about this at all? The ad club folks were thinking about the kind of competencies and skills that they wanted to focus on and impart across this experience for you. And decision making was one of the first ones that they came up with. So I, I open it up to y'all, like, let me know what you think. Why does this matter? Why are we even talking about this? In the chat or off mute, what are we thinking? Um, I think decision making matters because you don't want to just make a decision based off what you feel in the moment. You want to think about how the long term effects of the decision you're making will impact you, I guess. Yeah, got to think about the long term piece of it. What else? Also, you make decisions every single day, like big and small. So it's just really important to know how to make decisions that kind of align with your values and kind of taking everything into account. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, also, your decisions impact others as well. So it's important to make like informed decisions that not only affect you, but others as well. And like them having to like deal with like the consequences of your decisions as well. Yes, I love all of these. These are really, really great responses. I, I see that Greg also dropped into the chat about advertising is helping target, uh, target make great decisions. We've got good decisions making maximizes your efforts. Yes, all of that. I've got a hand up. Um, where's my, it was my me. participants. Yeah, go it ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what you had said earlier about your job. Um, being a good decision maker can also affect um, your future. So the longevity of it, the progression of it, it can pull you back in some ways. And as a fellow Libra, <laughs> decision making is definitely something that I need to become skillful at. So um, given the effect that it has for my future too, so. Yeah, all of this. <laughs> all right, power to the Libras from Chris. All right, so like, I think all of this is amazing. And, and the thing that, that I would kind of double down on is, you know, in two particular areas. So thinking of it as a core leadership skill, if you think about kind of, how strong decision making shows up. Like if you are able to move with um, strong decisions, you are going to be able to build a level of trust with the people who are around you, which will generate a sense of kind of followership. This will be people who are ready to follow you because they are so, they trust you so much about the decision that you're making. They know that they're in good hands, right? So in addition to all of what you said, I want to think, I want you to think about decision making as an opportunity for you to build your leadership skills. But also it was, it was called out. This is a core life skill. We are making a million tiny decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And so Sometimes if you make the wrong decision or no decision at all, the uh, impact might not be so big. It might be kind of inconsequential. If you think about going to your favorite restaurant and you select a menu item that you've never tried before, you made a decision to try something new and it ended up being kind of gross. And so like inconsequential, maybe it's, it's kind of gross. Maybe you eat it, maybe you don't, Meh. but you know, making the wrong decision can also have bigger impact. So using our same menu example, maybe you select, select something from the menu that includes an ingredient that you are allergic to and you didn't know because you didn't kind of do your due diligence. Like that's gonna have a way bigger impact on you in a day-to-day -day capacity. 
So I want you to kind of think about how decision making can be a really good place for you to start when it comes from building your leadership skills, building that life skill, and adding a little bit of rigor to your decision making can be really helpful when it comes to getting to a place where you can make your decisions with confidence, with intention, and being a place where you're able to defend those decisions that you're making. So in order to add a bit of rigor to this, I want to introduce five simple steps that you can do to really consider or be really intentional with your decision making process. So the first of which is going to be to define the problem or challenge or the opportunity, but be thoughtful about how you are going to um, about the challenge that you're trying to address. So with this, Think about making it specific, think about making it succinct, and think about making it easy to understand so that you can return to it and know that this is the problem that you're trying to solve for. When I think about that first example of the job, I, I don't think that I had clearly articulated my problem. Like I just wanted a job, but didn't I didn't really think about what exactly I wanted to do with my time. And so I kind of fell into whatever because I wasn't thoughtful about the, the problem I was trying to solve or the challenge the opportunity. So if, if you are able to spend some time defining the problem, it makes sure that you're solving for the right problem versus just like anything, right? So think about this as the very first step, spending time defining your particular problem. But the second step, generate alternatives. So like I said before, I, I, I felt like I had limited choices when it came to picking a job. And, and I think that there was an opportunity for me to create more options for myself. So when it comes to generating alternatives, you can do this in a couple of ways, right? So you can rely on your intuition and think about the things that are important to you. But if you need some outside opinions, like talk to an expert, like who who's in a field that you're really interested in that might be able to um, point you in a direction that you hadn't considered before. Like, how do you use your, your peers and friends and colleagues to brainstorm different ideas to get to a point where you're just having a, a few options in the air, some ideas, some options, create as many alternatives that make sense for you so that you feel like you're not backed into a corner of having limited choices. So get into the habit of thinking about how you can generate some options for yourself. The third step is evaluating those alternatives. So now you have all these choices in front of you, how do you weigh the difference? What do you do with that? Um, of course, I encourage you to lean on your, your intuition and your instincts as, as a data point, a way to evaluate your alternatives, but I don't want that to be the only place that you rely. So when we talk about evaluating the alternatives, think about what it might look like for you to, to get some data. Like, is it a pros and cons list that you're looking at? Maybe it's a, a quick and simple scorecard you're putting together. Like what might be the criteria that you are weighing your alternatives against? And if you had to just simply score in, in those areas, one to five, how would you score them? And how, you, how does that tally up and how does that get to a place where you're able to be a little bit more confident in the rigor that came behind that particular decision? You've got this data behind it so you can explain it if anybody ever tried to question you, right? So once you've been able to weigh your alternatives, you've got your scorecards, you've got your data points, you've got your gut that's also working for you as well, right? You're using your instincts here. You want to actually go ahead and make that decision, implement it. That's the easy part, right? We've done, we've done all the hard work and now we, we know that we're ready to go ahead and make our decision. But I do not want you to stop there because evaluation is the final kind of loop of this process. I, I'd like us to get to a point where we do feel comfortable recognizing that some of these decisions are reversible. And if you have new information, there's an opportunity for you to change course. So once you've made your decision, give yourself some space to, to think about what, how would you measure the success of that? What does good look like? How well did your decision solve for the problem that you were trying to solve for? And if it didn't do what you thought it was gonna do, create some space for you to pivot. There's an opportunity for you to move around rather than feeling stuck in, in that one decision that you've made. So, but, and this is, you know, personally something that I had struggled with, this idea of like, oh, I have to make the right decision. It has to be perfect. But it's like, eh, you know what? Perfection is the enemy of progress. Like, let's find a place for us to just get the decision out there and make a choice and give ourselves some flexibility and grace to recognize that there is probably going to be some space for us to iterate on that decision, for us to pivot, for us to continue to evolve. That's where the growth comes from. So, this decision-making process, we're thinking about it in five steps. First, be really, really clear about the problem you're trying to solve and think about that kind of in terms of the outcomes. Like, what do you want to get out of this? 
generate some alternatives and some options, weigh your options using not only your gut, but some other data points, go ahead and make, make that decision. And then give yourself space to reflect on it. Did it do what you thought it was gonna do? And if not, we can pivot. Now, are there any questions on this so far? Hi, KP, my name is Jensine. I just had one question is, is the, should we ask like, what is the problem? Um, what are, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna, cause I put the question together, but um, it doesn't really sound right. So I'll, I'll ask in the chat. Okay, yeah, go ahead and drop it in the chat. And, and let me go ahead and walk through an example that might help you kind of internalize this a little bit deeper. And I am going to use myself as an example. So I already told you about my, my poor decision with, with my career in the beginning, that first job that was just absolute garbage. Um, but I wanna to talk to you about the most recent career decision I've made. Um, so just kind of a bit about me, my background. I, I am a media planner by trade. Like that is what the first thing that I got really skilled at being able to do. But I got to a point in recognizing that I'd rather teach the thing than do the thing. And I was really in, empowered and excited about working with the people. So I wanted to transition into an HR or a talent focused role. So because of that, I made my pivot and I had I'd been doing my job for a little bit, learning and development at an ad agency. And I got to a point where I was like, eh, I'm feeling a little stuck, feeling a little stagnant. I need to do something else. I need, I need more for myself. And so I wanted to spend some time defining my problem. Now, I knew that I wanted to make more money and I knew that I wanted to just like think bigger and I knew that I was bored, but those weren't really the problems I was trying to solve. Because if I had moved to a job just for the money, it, I probably still wouldn't have been happy if I had moved, um, if I had just changed jobs for like any reason outside of like my core that probably wouldn't have done what I needed it to do. So in defining my problem, I recognized that what I wanted, what would feel satisfying for me was to get exposure in a broader way. I knew that I had my, my background was in advertising. I was trying to get into this HR field. What I want to do is be able to get to a point where I am a skilled HR professional, I can maneuver and operate in any industry, and I need exposure to get closer to that goal. So that's the problem that I, I set for myself, right? I need exposure so I can operate in any industry as an HR professional. Now, when I was generating some alternatives for myself, that looks like maybe grad school, so that I can think about, you know, deeper learning. Maybe it looks like a different role within my current company. You know, I'm working in HR there, working on learning and development. Maybe I can pivot to a different function. That could be an option. Or maybe I could just like leave the company altogether. Maybe this is a different role in a different industry that would kind of suit that, that need. So those are the, the options that I was kind of playing around with. I was doing my research to, to select grad school programs that felt like a fit for me. And I found one that I was really excited about. I was internally having conversations with my manager to talk about, all right, like here's what I think I might wanna do. What are the opportunities internally? Um, we had agreed on a, a job description for something that felt kind of exciting to be able to kind of expand my, my role and get to the point of solving my problem. But I was also actively interviewing externally. And so generating additional options in terms of what other jobs and other companies and other industries um, might, might be a fit, right? So with this in mind, I got to a place of, all right, like these are three pretty solid options, pretty solid options I have in front of me. And now I need to evaluate them. So the evaluation process here, um, it took a lot of reflection. So some of the kind of criteria that I was sorting around is first and foremost, like how well do each of these options deliver on the original stated problem? Like what's the impact? How well are these going to address that original problem that I had stated for myself? How much time is it gonna take me to, to do any of this? What are the financial benefits? How much money could I make in a different opportunity or how much money is it gonna cost for me to go to grad school? What are the benefits and implications that show up there? How challenged am I gonna be in any of these roles, any of these spaces? How much challenge am I, am I wanting, am I willing to, to commit to? And then the last one is, what are the relationships at stake? What might I lose? What might I gain? 
So these are the, all the things that were playing around in my head. And I, I see a question here about making decisions alone or with the team. I didn't do this by myself. Like this was, this was deep thought internally to make sure that I felt good about what I wanted to understand my problem, my outcomes, my success, but also like, what are other people, like who, who's gone to gone through grad school before? What's, the, what's that experience been like for you? Was it worth it? Like asking those questions of people, like folks who have made career moves, like how, what's that transition look like for you? Not to mention that I did all of this in the pandemic. So like starting a new job in a pandemic, like that was a whole other factor. Like, do I really wanna do that? Start remote work? like this is all new people, only virtual, is that good? Like who's done this before? Let's talk about it. Like, how do we, how do we get to a place of, of understanding? Like, like for me, is it worth it? Is any of this gonna be worth it? And so it took a lot of kind of data collection of talking to my friends, doing some research, like trying to figure out like what felt right for me so I could get to a point where I could make my decision. So in making the decision, this is where I landed. So I decided to go ahead and pursue the grad school opportunity. Um, and as it turns out, I actually just finished my first week of school last week. So I am officially uh, working through a master's of organizational psychology at Columbia. So I'm really, really excited to be able to do that and have exposure to different people in different industries and really deepen my learnings. So like that's like thing one. But thing two is I, ended up taking a role at DoorDash. I've been at DoorDash for like three months. Like this is a new, new, new experience. I was interviewing, working with the team and was really clear about my goals and intentions. So they knew that grad school was something I was considering and they were like all for it. So this opportunity to really, really lean into solving that problem, like it took a lot of thought and intention and all of the, the rigor and intention that lacked in that first decision. I brought all of that to this space to get to a place where I'm much more secure and happy with that decision. So remember, we don't just stop at making the decision. We have to evaluate it and create space for self-reflection. So um, grad school, that's a year I'm committed to that. Like I'm seeing that through, but the job piece is a little bit more flexible. So I like to give myself some space every six months or so to just check in with myself. Am I getting out of this what I intended to get out of it? And while I think that DoorDash is a great company that I could stay with, maybe the role itself is not a perfect fit. And maybe there's an opportunity for me to pivot. Like I said, like there's an opportunity for us to change course once we get to a place where, you know, we can create a little bit of distance and self-reflection on how well did that decision impact the stated goal. So I'm, you know, when I hit my six months, I'll do a check-in with myself, create a little bit of space to think about it. Right now I'm happy. So I'm feeling good about the decision that I've made. So this is kind of the five steps in action for me. And I hope that brought a little bit more color to the framework to give you a, an opportunity to kind of think about that. I, I do wanna pause here uh, to see if there are any questions I'm missing in the chat or if anybody wants to come off mute. There was to... one question in the chat. Um, I think Jensine asked that she asked if you should ask during interviews what the problem is that you need to solve for the role. I think that's a, I think that's a great question that you can ask. It activates, um, Okay, so two things are happening. In an interview, that is also a space for you to interview them for what it is that, that you would be doing. So they're not, it's not just a one way, it should be absolutely be a two way experience. And so asking them a question about like their biggest challenges is a really good way for you to kind of articulate or get them to articulate what you might be working on and opportunity for you to plug in uh, easily. So you, for you to think about where your skills might be able to um, help support that particular problem. And it'll also give you like gold star in the interview if you're able to demonstrate pretty immediately that you'd be able to swoop in and solve for any challenges that, that they're seeing. So I, I do recommend the, you know, asking about that, uh, asking this problem question in the interview. And the way that I might phrase it is like, what are the biggest challenges you're facing? And how do you, uh, think I might be able to um, attack those. So that's what I would say there. Let's see, what else? Uh, Lynn and then Ashley also have questions. 
Hey. Yeah, hello. Hi. Um, so I, when you were saying your options just now, I did notice you said like solid options. So I was wondering when you're faced with, for instance, um, maybe the situation you're in, it doesn't feel right, but like it's solid, you know, it's stable. And then it doesn't feel right for you, but then you also have to take a risk if you're going to do something else and you don't have a backup plan. What What's your plan of action when it comes to a situation where there isn't just like solid across all boards? Um, I am all about calculated risk. So I think that there is always opportunity for you to take that risk, but I, I do want you to enter it with some intention and recognize that there is a place for you to perhaps pivot later. So, you know, one of the things that my dad has always kind of imparted on me is this idea of like everything is temporary and kind of in the long run, like in the grand scheme of your life, everything is kind of temporary. So even if you find yourself in a situation that is like, not ideal for you know two to even four years it's like all right on the other side of that there can be something better for you if you create some space for yourself to evaluate the decision if, it, if that risk wasn't the thing that you maybe should have done what can you learn from that and how can you create a, a strategy to maneuver yourself out of that situation so I think that the risk can be worth it I'm all for calculated risk so I'm talking about this idea of evaluating weighing the options what are the pros and cons like what what are the things that could go wrong worst case scenario what might that look like and like are you prepared to kind of step into that for the benefit that you might gain on the other side of it is the juice worth the squeeze and that's up to you kind of to de decide for yourself but I do want you to feel like you are kind of making that decision from a place of being informed versus just just rolling with it so lead with being informed, but also recognize that like if it didn't work out, you can pivot and it might take a little bit longer than you originally intended, but like creating that that exit strategy will give you some space to to maneuver. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you kind of answered that in the last question, but what advice would you give to someone who is intimidating, intimidated or anxious about taking that next step? Like for example, graduate school or a new role in a company? Oh, you know, that intimidation factor, that imposter syndrome, like that's a, that's the thing that I I struggle with myself. And so honestly, I have to I, I just it just goes back to is the juice worth the squeeze? Like am I am I scared of this? because I, I don't think I can do it. Like, am I, like why, why am I afraid? Like, what are the things that you have to do to kind of unpack for yourself what that emotion is? Like once you kind of name the emotion, you can spend some time with it and kind of see like, well, is this fear? Where is this nervousness coming from? Why do I feel this way? Well, what's true? Like, what are the skills that I know that I have? And how do I, I think that I can like tactically, tangibly apply those things? Because a lot of it is, it's like, you're afraid of the unknown, but I think that what can be helpful is just grounding yourself in what is actually true. Like, forget like all of the what ifs and what all, like what, what if it goes wrong? What if it goes right? Like what, what if it goes right? And what if you did have the skills all along and you just were like, you were cutting yourself off before you could even fly, right? So I, battle with that a little bit I don't know, on a daily basis. Like I'm in a new job. Things move way faster than I thought they were going to be. I'm trying to go to school full time and, and do this job that's brand new. I don't know these people. Like I'm trying my best every day to, to kind of show up as the best version of myself. I know that they hired me because they knew I could do the job. And so, all right, well, if you know I can do it, I guess I better know I can do it too. And so kind of like leaning into that and owning your power where you can it is hard, it's a daily challenge, but I, I would encourage you to root yourself in the things you know to be true about where your skills and your strengths are, which will give you space to, to really continue in that space. Um, I, I have an exercise that I, I wanna be able to take us into. So just kind of mindful of time, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I don't see any more hands. So I am going to move us into a little bit of an activity to give y'all space to kind of put this into action. Now, as I've been talking, I hope that it's kind of brought to mind some big decisions that you've maybe made in the past or something that's coming up. And so I'd like for you to, to bring to mind a decision and hopefully it's something that's like kind of a little, a little meaty, a little juicy, um, so that you can reflect on what we've talked about so far. So for that particular decision, 
which of the five steps did you use? What are you already doing well? But also, which steps didn't you use? What might you want to start to integrate into your decision making process? And for the third question here, if you had used those missing steps, how might that have changed the way that you approach that decision? How might it have changed the outcome? How might it have changed anything? So I want to put you in the space of reflection. I'll give you a minute to just jot some things down for yourself. And then I'm going to ask Maya to open up the breakout room so that you can share this with your group. So let me just give you one minute to jot some notes down for yourself. What's your decision? Which steps did you use? Which didn't you? And how might it have changed things? I've got a minute timer going for you, Kristen. Thank you. Got about 10 seconds left if you want to just get in your last thought. All right. So you've got some notes down for yourself. I'm going to ask Maya to open up the breakout rooms. You're going to be in, uh, what is this, groups of seven? Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna throw you into groups. You're gonna have eight minutes to share within your groups. And then please make sure that you are nominating one person to come back and share. What are the themes that you're, you're picking up across the group? All right, so I will see y'all in eight minutes. And you're now able to join your breakouts. Hey, I didn't mean to move, put you in a breakout, KP. Okay, I'll just decline the not. Now. Thank you. <laughs> Jesse still hasn't joined his breakout room. Neither has Nicholas Allen. Jesse's in his. Nicholas Allen, are you having trouble joining your breakout? Oh, guess not. Guess not. <laughs> All right. So it's just us here now. <laughs> it's just us friends. You're doing amazing. Thank you. Oh, wow. OK, sorry. <laughs> Hi, guys. Yes, Hi. KP girl, you are nailing it. You are <laughs> such a teacher. I love how you just break it down. And you broke it down in such a you know, bite size where people can understand what you're saying. Um, we might have to tap you for master class. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, like. I this is what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but mm -hmm. I also am trying to challenge, but I told you I was trying to challenge myself to like do different things like the trust to help, help you make those decisions. Like that's really important. I, I do want to encourage you to strengthen that intuition for yourself as well. Like keep, keep really in touch with what it is that you want so that you are, you are not kind of just like following what other people want for you. So yes, for sure, consult with people who you trust to help you make your decision, but don't lose yourself in the process. What other themes are we noticing? I can go. Um, I think something that we discussed was kind of the idea of once we have a decision to make, we get slightly overwhelmed. So we're so focused or consumed by kind of looking at alternatives or trying to figure out solutions that we don't necessarily focus on a problem itself. Like we don't recognize it until it's kind of been in the past. Um, and that was sort of a general thing. 
to find that problem and return to it. That can help you with what they call analysis paralysis. When you get into evaluating all your options and you, you evaluating so hard that you can't even make a decision, like go back to your out, the, the problem. What's the outcome that you're trying to achieve? That can help you kind of get unstuck when you find yourself in that swirl. I can go for, for my group. I think for us, um, one of the two things that I that we had saw um, that was a theme throughout all of us was finding things that were more logical within our alternatives and also finding things that were just more emotionally compatible to us as well. Um, Cause all of ours was, all of our problems within different situations, but I feel like those were the two things that stuck out that was similar throughout all of us, so. There's space for both, both the logic and emotional. So think about uh, how much weight you wanna give to any of those factors, but I wouldn't remove them from the decision-making process. Like your emotions matter, like that stuff is real. So listen to that, because uh, think about how that might show up for you on the other side of the decision if you didn't trust your gut. Like if you, if you weren't, if you were ignoring those things that you were pushing down, it's like, yeah, no, Find the emotion, name it, and deal with it. And you can think about how it factors into your decision making once you've been able to, to name it. We have one more group. I can talk. Um, for my group, one thing that I noticed, um, like a common theme, was when it comes to decision making, are we going to step our comfort zone or not are we going to accept the challenge and put ourselves out there or are we going to just continue to do what we're most comfortable with and I thought that was interesting to think of when you have to evaluate and look at what the problem you're solving and if you're going to grow from there yeah and, and do you want to grow from there like that's the other thing you have to decide for yourself how challenged are you prepared to be do you want to be stretched or do you want to to be in a place where there's more comfort for you like that's all of the other factors. So it's like, like, for example, when I was trying to decide if I wanted to leave my job or not, like, I was not sure in a pandemic how much more challenge I could take outside of already being in a pandemic. Like, is it worth it for me to be in a new job, the new environment and learn all new people? Like, yes, it's a growth moment, but like my emotional and mental capacity, do I have the capacity to deal with that right now? So I decided that I did, but it was something that I battled with for a while. Like how challenged do I want to be in that moment? So if growth is an outcome, consider it part of your evaluation criteria, but like it doesn't always have to be depending on where you are, like what the context of your situation is. Uh, so I think, I think that was all groups. Is there any group that hasn't been represented? I think that was everybody, okay. So y'all have been a, a fabulous audience for me today. I think that the one thing that I would like to uh, leave with you is because, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff and I don't intend for all of this to kind of be into action immediately, but I would like you to focus on just one thing. Like what is the one incremental thing that you will do differently to give you some space to, to approach your problem solving in a different way the next time. So in the chat, I invite all of you to just drop a couple of thoughts. What's one thing you're going to do differently the next time that you need to make a big decision? Hmm. Slow down to define the problem. Mm -hmm. Map it out. No more analysis paralysis. Consult the experts. Ah, ah, beautiful. Seek advice. We're systematically breaking it down. Check in with yourself, right? Ah, this is beautiful, y'all. This makes me feel good because now I know you took away something from this, this time together. So I will say thank you, thank you for your, your time and attention. Thank you to the Ad Club for hosting and inviting me to, to have this conversation. Um, let, me, let me drop my, my um, LinkedIn in the chat so that you can uh, connect with me if that would be helpful for you. I'm happy to, to follow up with y'all in other spaces. Um, and offer whatever help I can um, from whatever perspective might be useful for you. 
outside of that, thank you. And while you're doing that, um, KP, just thank you again for coming in, for dropping these beautiful gems. You know, I think the best one I heard was, is the juice worth the squeeze? And <laughs> I love all that you shared. With your permission, we're going to share uh, your, your presentation with the fellow with the fellows, with the interns, <laughs> and you know they'll be able to look it over and use it as a tool in the future to make yeah. their use their to make decisions. Yeah. So thank you again, KP. You can hop off whenever you're ready. Yeah. For the thank rest of the you. interns, just a reminder that we'll see each other next week at Club Interns. I'll see you all tomorrow. Any last notes, Aisha? Oh yes, I want you all to remember that the Growth Initiative ha is having an intern, I mean, an orientation tonight. So please, please, please make sure you are there. I love all of the social media push that's going on on LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, the outcome looks awesome. Um, just, you know, just make sure that you guys continue to show up. This internship is as great as you put your put into it you know so we're providing you with the resources but in order to benefit from it you have to utilize it so we thank you so much for joining us today we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the KPI um, assessment I know that's going to be very interesting I took mine so I can't wait for us to explore that with Shamika and Julius and if there aren't any more questions um, we can head on out and I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Yes. And just to answer Brittany's question out oh. loud, um, if you have to mess with session, session, please email me prior to. You have the syllabus, so you have all of the dates. Um, read it. Shout out to Talia, who I know read the syllabus. And <laughs> just go from there. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Yeah. Thank There's you. nothing else. You guys can go. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.